So we're going to uh, next up, we have our law enforcement panel, and we'll have our panelists come up to the stage here in just a few moments. That's made up of our trusted community members and providers who are there when a resident is experiencing a mental health crisis. Our very own Community Police Alliance coordinator, Damien Stackhouse, will be moderating our panel for the purpose of broadening our perspective and reducing the barriers between our systems. That, that really, we all want the same things, right? And we want everyone to go home safely. Damien is a New Jersey Step and MBC alum of Rutgers New Brunswick, where he obtained his bachelor's and master's in social work. Damien has always been a listener and sought to give others the counseling and guidance that the community relies on. He also is currently the first Community Police Alliance coordinator, and he receives, analyzes, acts upon, and follows up on referrals provided by participating law enforcement agencies. Damon is truly a youth advocate that believes when we change the trajectory of our kids' lives, it changes the trajectory of the community's life. Damien is an activist, an activist for social justice. Damien Sek. I got myself a therapist. 
because I've been dealing with a lot. And it's okay to say I need help. So I went and I made sure that I'm having our behavioral health department find me a black male therapist because I need someone that I can relate to, that I can look at, and not feel uncomfortable while we're talking. So come on, Memphis. I need to come on. Y'all should have been up here. Bios backwards. Establishment of a newly formed county working plan, 
CIT Steering Committee established a mental health diversion program at the Somerset County's Park Security and established establishment of CIT training for county detectives, sheriff's departments, and municipal police officers. Uh, Nicole Crowell. Okay. Nicole Tan. <laughs> Nicole obtained her graduate degree at Capella University, where she obtained her master's degree in marriage and family therapy. While in graduate school, she began her career in psychiatric mental health services, working in psychiatric emergency rooms. Since then, obtaining her LM, LA MFT, Nicole has extended her services at the Bridgeway Pest, working as a school based therapist in, at elementary, middle, and high school levels. Nicole has clinical experience working with youth, adolescents, and adults and families who are experiencing all levels of mental health crisis. Nicole has also recently take on, taken on the role as a police liaison for the Bridgewater um, Pest to ensure collaboration with law enforcement regarding supporting county residents and providing mental health support. And finally, <laughs> Officer Nicole. She's my first time. Right. <laughs> I'm getting so, nervous. <laughs> <laughs> she, you know, in short, last year wanted to do something um, because we had lost the young lady in a bike accident. And we had a bike rodeo and we were raising mountains. And I, I was struggling trying to put it together. And I seen, you know, all this Nicole on the streets of Somerville, and I was like, hey, would you like to join in on this initiative? And she said, no problem. And was there from the beginning to the end. So, Officer Nicole Grace began her office as an officer of Somerville since March of 2015, was currently assigned to the community policing unit. Before becoming a police officer, Nicole worked as a dispatch for the Touching Police Department and the Franklin Township Police Department. In 2019, she attended and graduated from John Stafford Police Academy in Cleveland County, and then went on to work for the New Jersey Transit Police Department. At the transit, she was the first female officer to become an emergency service unit. Nicole came to Somerville in 2015 and was assigned to the patrol division. Nicole's favorite aspects of community policing have been building relationships with the community and merchants in downtown Somerville as well as being a bridge and gap between the police and the community. Welcome, my panelists. Thank you. What we're going to do is we're going to go through a series of questions. Everybody's going to have approximately. No, we're not getting any five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sometimes we got to have a test. Just a little. Just a little. We'll get about four minutes. About four minutes. Because I want everybody to get a chance to try to explain what's going on. This panel, if you, if you haven't understood what's going on, we have. A mother, we have resilience, we have a county representative of the prosecutor's office, we have someone that deals with mental health crisis on a daily basis with pets, and we have law enforcement that is on the beat. We try to cover every aspect of law enforcement in the community with a mental health crisis. So, Ms. Jordan. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question. I'm coming to you. So you know, you know, you got time and you listen to me. As a mother of a black man that experiences both as a police officer and someone with mental illness, what is the intersectionality of these things like you and why? Do we need family members 
our mental health population at the table having this conversation. Okay, real quick. Uh, I want the black men to stand up for the Black men. I want the audience to stand up. I want the audience to stick to look and see the problem. See the problem. So, okay, I see this. Okay, let me go to my thing real quick. Um, I have two sons. I spent the majority of my working career in North New Jersey, again, at University Hospital. I was the president of the nurses union there. And I spent 40 years working with predominantly pregnant women with substance abuse issues, HIV, and mental illness. Okay, I thought my life was going to be so different. I have four children, I'm very proud of them. My daughter was the chief probation officer for Union County, proud of her. My son works for the ones who son works for uh, the Veterans Administration in Philadelphia. My middle son is one who's a police officer. He got out of school from American. Only job he could get was being a police officer in Washington, D.C. My youngest son is the one that's mentally challenged. He graduated the top 1% of his class in Harvard University. I was a single mom. Okay, I thought my life with that work graduate, I thought my life was so different. I was looking for that Black American Express card. I just, I just, I just knew it was coming back from my classes. Um, but he accepted his job at Credit Suisse. He had a full ride paid for by Brothers, um, Brothers, Lehman Brothers, and so on. When he got that acceptance, I was with him. And I was with him when he moved into that penthouse apartment in New York City on 10th and 58th Street. I was also with him when he had that first breakdown at Columbia Presbyterian after being one of the youngest members on the trading floor for Credit Suisse. His account holders money had to be a minimum of $10 million for him to be able to quote. He used to get up at four in the morning when the markets closed overseas and go to bed at two o'clock in the morning. All right, so that's, that's my middle son, my youngest son. And I have my oldest son, my middle son, William. He's a police officer, but he know other job. And I asked him, I called Jamie, I said, how do you feel about this question? He told me so. He said, if you're a black man, remember I asked the black man to spread out. He said, you have a target on your back. And if you are a homeless black man, you got the homeless on. He said, in five years, he worked Metro, the third district of Washington, D.C. He never had to draw his gun. And I asked him why. Before I say that, I'm going to take a quick look at it. <laughs> One day I went with him, and you know, police officers told me something. And we went to Popeyes. There was a car in front, right? The driver was two o'clock in the morning, but the driver, the driver, a car in front, car in the back. These boys surrounded the car. So, Officer Bill, Officer Bill, I thought I, I thought I locked you up place. He said, yeah, I'm out. Now you're going to buy me a cheap sandwich. And I said, I love it. We're going to work. I said, weren't you afraid? I'm afraid. He said, well, those boys know where I live. They know where I work. They know my car. He said, where am I going to go? They know me. And I identify with them. So keep that in mind. Now I'm going to fast forward to another instance where my son needed services. And even though I'm going to say if you pay taxes in Somerset County, that's one of the best resources available. And it's worth every penny that we invest in our community. So I'm grateful for that. So I called past, they come out to the house. They pick up my, my son who's having problems. They take him, whisk him away. And for some reason, they put him on a 72 hour hold. He calls up, how we got a phone out? He calls up one of his friends who's a magistrate. Now, if you look at those in the middle, he's waiting for the judge to declare. But before the judge could declare, because they were so intimidated by my son, because he knows how to talk, he played a good game. 
he was discharged. He was straight home to attack my son, who's 6'3", 300 pounds. How that worked out for me. My son, as a police officer, picked up my younger son by the neck, held him above his head, and he said, you know, I love you. I'm going to help you get some friends with you. He said, you know, I love my baby brother. I don't think that much about you. So think about what you're going to do before I interact with my brother. And he held us closely. And he cried with him. So every time he would go on the streets in Washington, D.C., he would think about his baby.
didn't, didn't really have like a, a brief explanation of the resiliency of life. Okay. Being a law enforcement officer is an incredibly rewarding profession. When officers are polled in a recent study for police one, 72% chose law enforcement field to help people. By 64% said serving the community was one of the top three most satisfying aspects of the job. However, over the course of our career, there's a paradigm shift and we become cynical, pessimistic, non-trusting, and overly rigid. Officers nationwide are facing unprecedented pressures including departmental scrutiny, the rise of anti-law enforcement sediments, community demands for police reform, in addition to the rise of crime rates and police targeted violence and ambushes. Together with the rise of retirements and resignations, plus the lack of qualified new hires, officers are now expected to do more with less. With our daily roles and responsibilities, we hold many hats for the community. But those duties come with an emotional price tag to all. People experience stress and trauma intermittently throughout their lives. On average, they say civilians, non law enforcement, non military, have three. By law enforcement, has 180. Some of the examples of critical incident traumas are mass casualties, shooting incidents, exposures to hazmat. The threat of injury or death, death of a child, crimes against children, death of a fellow officer, or suicide. We have occupational stressors, our on-call status, shift work, mandatory overtime, increased workload, burnout, compassion fatigue, roles in specialized units, such as undercover officer, hostage, or crisis negotiation. In addition, we have organizational stressors, poor supervision or leadership, Lack of support, being passed over for, by promotion, conflicts with coworkers and supervisors. Compounded by outside stressors, like family, relationships, divorce, children, parenting, finances, legal issues, aging, and physical health ailments, all can lead to a multitude of conditions. With experience exposure to these types of traumas without treatment, it can lead to substance use disorders, PTSD, complex PTSD, and suicide ideations. Sadly, statistics for law enforcement officers reported being higher than the national average across the board. For substance use disorders, civilians are at 16.5% while law enforcement sits at 30. For PTSD, civilians are at 6% where law enforcement reported law enforcement is at 35%. Now keep in mind, this is reported, so the numbers are a lot higher. But most importantly, we are 43% higher than the national average when it comes to suicide. So let's get into line of duty deaths. For 2023, from last case numbers, there have been 42 line of duty deaths from across the nation. There's been 53 suicides. We have lost 53 officers to suicide. Four of them have been in the state of New Jersey. We are more likely to succumb by our own hands than by in the line of duty. Law enforcement professionals are supposed to be shower pros. Sorry, I'm humanizing. <laughs> Let's take a look. We do not seek help due to guilt or shame. We fear to be perceived, we fear the perceived perception of our fellow officers being viewed as being weak. Plus we are forced to face on-job related consequences such as our loss of our job. New Jersey Attorney General's Office mandated in 2019 that agencies were to implement a resiliency program officer. This program would set into motion a frontline early warning system to assist officers struggling. RPOs are peer-to-peer -peer support for the officer. Our conversations are confidential, 
And the goal is to get the officer to cop the cop or a professional as soon as possible, if and when needed. But to be completely honest with you, some conversations are just with someone who wants to hug, literally. The program was designed to give the officer tools in their toolbox for actions and mindsets that they can use to bounce back from stress, adversity, and hardships over the course of their career. The program focuses on whole body health, mind, body, and spirit. The most important part is that this program lies and dies by the agency's leadership. Without buying from command staff at law enforcement agencies, the officers will not follow through with getting the help that they so desperately need. Thank you. Officers of time worn by their own hands. None of us know why. It's painful. <laughs> Chief Executive of the So, as the prosecutor's office leads law enforcement in the county, What initiatives and spirit efforts are you doing taking on these views of the issues? And I'm just going to push you towards the idea that mental health that version. Because I think that would really help a lot of those Thank you. We'll end up in the same spot. So, uh, in 30 years, 37 years of private practice, our main incidences of dealing with mentally ill really came in cases where insanity or diminished capacity was going to be defensive. So our involvement was really sort of case specific. We didn't have any, but it certainly was not an everyday occurrence. Uh, John and I uh, were both judges in the school of And there I began to see uh, the real uh, life effects that the mental health And I sat in all three divisions. Uh, in the family division, is it there? Yes, it is there. In the civil division, is it there? Yes, it is there as well. And in the criminal division, um, it's pervasive. So after John and I got in, I was asked by the assignment judge to go to Miami with him. And the criminal division, which is a county, I am Dave County, and they're known uh, expertise in this area. And I was shocked uh, at the statistics that fall so unfairly on the mentally They are incarcerated at a much higher rate. Uh, the problems they have to deal with, both at home, Medication non compliance and system And the statistics of locking up the mentally ill as opposed to getting them to treatment are very disheartening. It's a sad comment in our society to lose the things of the people who are near and dear to us. We just have an illness. That's all it is. It's just that it's treated. So, you know, there's an old saying about the weather, it talks about it, but it doesn't. Uh, we're going to be doing something about it in the prosecutor's office. Uh, this is a unique opportunity for us to step forward and make a difference. And in that vein, uh, we have already appointed the county working group, which is a series of professionals. Occupations, community leaders to address mental health resources. We just appointed, we had our first meeting. That's a very important step to get this topic on the list. Uh, and that's what we've done. And 
As part of that committee, there's also a committee on this is CIT steering committee. CIT, one of the things you don't know is crisis intervention team. That's the acronym for I'm very pleased to say uh, that we have our first annual CIT training session scheduled for June 19, 2020. We'll be having a constant day 20 to 23. Most of the municipal about 10 or so mental health professionals for a 40 hour uh, training session. Project Chief Detectives of uh, Central County and I attended the Warren County CIT training. So we've been looking for the mission mark. So we're starting to break the others now. Our law enforcement officers. Are going to get the training they need so they know how to deal with these very difficult, complex situations. Um, emergency calls, they don't have a lot of information. And they often run into very complicated situations. And we want our officers to know how to respond, to know what to do, and to uh, be able to assist uh, and, and not be a situation where we're escalating the problem or rapidly escalating. So, we're really proud of the efforts that we've made to help the area. And last but not least, is our office has instituted a mental health diversion program for those individuals that have criminal offenses, large offenses, and things. One of the things we were able to do for our screeners was get on the initial screen called Is Mental Health Information on this call? On this technology is power. So if we can identify these individuals, many of whom don't like to speak about what's happening to them, we want them to go to class courses. But the bottom line is we have a program, we only have two people who are just about ready to deliver this that are charged criminally. The mentally ill don't need to be incarcerated, they need treatment. We're not speaking about every day, we're speaking about the vast majority of them. Fortunately, we have the resources in some way to do that. We're going to do the models. We're not going to, somebody will adjust the judiciary. They don't have the resources, the information that we need to look at these things that we do. Uh, and so, if we put in a person into the mental health diversion court, uh, all proceedings are suspended against that person. Which we call the health and wellness therapy. Uh, there's a medication composition severe We'll be able to maintain. And if the person is not complying, our office will deal with that rather than relying on a third party or the work to understand what it takes to find someone who needs to be that. So, this all started as somewhat of a journey for me as a judge, and I began to see firsthand how pervasive this problem is. And now uh, I'm in a position to do something about it, which is very important. So, uh, there's a number of faces here that are interested. We'll be the individuals up here, and we'll be happy to hear from Sanders and you. Yes, yes. We're happy to hear from you and your story, and your work on this version of how these issues. I'm very proud of our office. Uh, we're going to do a mindfulness coach on making sure the mentally ill get what they deserve treatment. That's what they need. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nicole, can you please explain? Concept of how it how does it help when you respond to a mental health crisis with our residents? And um, 
Do you have any stories that you'd like to share that you're already working with your referral population or something like this? So I'm part of the community based community. So we're mainly, I mean, I teach there, so I'm in schools also, but so our main focus is downtown Summer on Main Street. We check out the business owners, we kind of just walk up down the street, especially in the summer, just kind of keep an eye on things, preventing. You know, maybe some kind of crime that might happen. You know, they see us out there be visible. We want to be approachable to, you know, our residents and business owners. See us out there. Just, you know, have communication. Um, now we do have a little bit of a problem with a little homelessness down there and some you know, mental health. We do have personal deal with that a lot, um, and that comes with alcohol problems and. That'll lead me into my story, which yeah. <laughs> so uh, Anthony back there. Um, I had met with him because we were actually the stigma conference last year. I realized how many resources we had, and so I was like, I was totally in the crowd. Um, so I met with Anthony and told me what he was able to provide. So walking on Main Street, um, there's an individual I see him who I've never seen him before. So, sorry, I'm nervous. Uh, oh, but so I see this guy walking down the street. He's going like this, screaming, and I'm like, I see people are getting a little bit scared. So I go over, I'm like, you know what's going on? And he's like, uh, he's just babbling. He was telling me he was an alcoholic. He had lost a family member. It was just kind of like all over the place. So I would see him. He, he didn't, you know, he calmed down after I talked to him. I'd see him pretty much now every day. And he was drinking and it's not alcohol on him. So I would work on him, get to know him, talk to him because I'm out there. So finally, he says he wants to get help. So I'm like, perfect, because Anthony back there, that's one of the things that he's from Richard Hall. He does um, we called him up, he said, I'll be right out there. He comes, picks this guy up, takes him to Carrier. So he's gone for what, like two weeks, I guess he was out there. He comes back, he seems better. So he's like, you know, I, I want to thank you. Like, I'm going to give him some. And I have my partners over here. I really love your voice. So he comes back and he's like, he says he's doing good and he got help. And uh, like, I want to buy you lunch. So I'm like, don't worry about it. Like, I was leaving for vacation this week. I wasn't going to be around. I said, like, oh, we're ready to go. And he builds up a little bit. It happened to be my birthday. And I didn't get any better. I told Amy in the story. <laughs> so he's like, I said, when I come back, we can kick the baby. Like, meet me in front of Central Pizza on Tuesday. I'm like, okay. And I didn't think he was going to remember. I said, I'll meet I come back. I'm like, well, let me just, uh, with my other partner, I'm like, let me just go by there. Let me make sure he's not there. I would feel bad if I stood him up. Sure enough, we drive against the PCF out there. So it kind of broke my heart. Like, he remembered the whole, you know, week. So, like, don't worry about lunch. You know, I'm ready for the movies. Please, please come in. So, we go in to Central Pizza. This guy has a little homework picking. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's a guy who's at rock bottom, has nothing. Had nothing. He was like, I don't even know if he had housing in that place, but it was a big giant part of the cake from shop, right? That he had my name put on it. <laughs> um, but I see like the sticker, it's like 25 bucks. So someone who has no money, he's spending his 25 dollars on me. Well, I don't get to, you know, near somebody who struggles from mental illness, alcoholism, and he wants to thank me for doing my job. I'm supposed to be but he doesn't, I affected him, but he doesn't realize what he did for me. We're out here, you know, I was, I'm doing my job. But a lot of times we don't get to see what happens to these people after they go off to the past or whatever. And 
I do care, we care. There's a lot of, I, I can't speak for all the police, I can speak for myself, but I care. And I bring this stuff home. I, I have a trouble meeting it at work, but I care about, you know, I care about everybody in the town that I serve. And I was just thankful to have that experience with what he did for me. And I, I had my whole family crying every time. <laughs> you know, it was just, I don't know. So this is my passion that I do have people that are out there. And I don't feel that I need to tell. <laughs> but it, it was just. I don't know. And I did see him recently because he kind of disappeared again. But I, I hope he's doing better. He said he was. I don't know, but, but that's my So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I told him not that. We are going to do a uh, speed round. But just at that celebration, what's going on? The, the shift in how we break down the stigma, what our law enforcement is doing, and how we care about our residents the same way we care about your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. It is, they are human. It, it, it's, it's not them and us. It's just us. So, let's see. We're going to start with the code. I'm going to come all the way back. And this is going to be our last time we get a chance to speak. It's going to be two minutes. You're going to tell us why you get out of bed and why you continue to do this. And what do you want everybody to take home? For what you got. So why I got it, that obviously is those story, that story I just told you, but that is what gets me up, you know, helping people. I teach there. I love being with the kids. I want them to have relationships with the police in a positive way, right? We deal, most of us officers, we're going to like people's worst phase of their lives when we're falls. So now getting me up in the morning is the positive side of it. Getting to get out there and talk to people and hear what they have to say, hear what they don't like about the town and or problems that they're having. Maybe I can help fix it or make it better. That's what gets me up every morning and wanting to come to work. And what do you want? What do you want everybody to take? We're here for you. Please, I mean, whatever the stigmas are that do surround police, it's not all of us. There's good and bad in every profession. We know that. But we're here and we want to help and just make it a better place to live. Very good. Thank you. Nicole, why you get out of bed? Because um, I know screening and going out on the calls is not easy. You take it home with you. I mean, I just related to your story a lot, not you know, the specifics of it, but the reality of that. Our jobs are we're often seeing like the worst day of people's lives and the faces that they remember when we do it. And then we often don't know what happens. <laughs> like, you know, so we, you know, get them to a safe place where they need to be or we refer them out to where they need to be. We often don't know like what happens after that. So we, I mean, you know, people just have they don't we don't always get to hear the positive stories that come out. Um, but other, today, though, I do have to say, there was somebody that came by at our table and probably didn't realize how much she but like, said, you know, that our services that kind of like the over six for life being like very positive. You know, it was the start to where they need to be, and it just went like, a lot better. So, just those small success stories and what people should walk away with is, I think, it's, you know, it doesn't matter what degree you have or what college you went to, I think just the reality that like patience and kindness and compassion just goes a long way. Assistant prosecutor. Yeah, so the reason I get up is because my wife makes me. I'll tell you that as a trial attorney for 37 years, I'm sorry. 
My son was a police officer in D.C. Got her on the Carnegie Mellon to become a, a data analyst. He's a good man. And um, he was a victim of a police brutality in Pittsburgh because they thought his idea was fake. So there's a whole lot of things we have to do with mental health illness. That's a true story. There's a whole lot of things that we have to do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the other thing is that I, talk, I, I work with a baby. Uh, I come to work one day, and there's this girl in the shopping cart with babies. She says, uh, I'm saying this, today I'm going to kill myself. I said, well, can you wait till lunch? And I'm like, hey, I have to do another series of friends. And they have to be able to connect to somebody. And that's the point I'm trying to make. We got the services, and we were able to help her. But the most important thing is we are coachable. Be available, and if you don't know, call Damien or me. <laughs> we can do this for about another hour, but we don't have that time. But I don't know about y'all. I learned a lot. I cried on the inside, and let me get a chance to. But I thank you all for just sharing this out, being personal, personable, and giving us something to take away from what we're doing today. So, a round of no questions. Okay. So proud of this community, Somerset County, for what everybody does, for what we do for people. And anybody that's doing this work, if you ever need a hug, I'll hug you. I'll come in a minute because this is what makes me keep staying on the mental health field. All right? Now we'll continue with this theme of wanting better for our community and humanizing these experiences. And the experience as well that many people, whether you like to admit it or not, sometimes we're quick to shove off someone who may be different than us. And so we'll be hearing from Mary Rose Feely, representing the agency, not in easy fix, and for the younger me. Mary Rose brings a family perspective, having experienced the stigma of substance use disorders, what we previously called addiction, firsthand, and her decision to no longer let that have a hold on her. Mary Rose Feely is a passionate humanitarian and advocate for positive change in the opioid crisis. And she's the founder of For the Younger Me a movement building a camp for children with loved ones affected by addiction. So without further ado, Mary Rose Feely. Ladies and gentlemen, today I stand before you honored and proud to be the speaker of Not Easy Better. Jackson Reynolds, the proud founder of Not Easy Six, died February 18, 2021, from fat health poisoning and addicted to drugs. This was news that was going to change my life. My older brother, Ian Healy, and Jackson Reynolds were best friends. They loved each other like brothers, and this was the type of friendship that would stand to the test of time. And Jackson Reynolds had this really special gift about him, and it's one that keeps giving back to Somerset County. And it was the honor of being able to bring people together to speak to them, to empower them, to bring a voice into communities. And Jackson had a mission. He was here on a mission. And Jackson's mission is also Ian's mission. And Ian is my brother, so that makes it my family's mission. 
So Jackson's mission is also my mission. And that mission is to bring humanity back into community, to hold in person live events, to enjoy music, to celebrate the divinity in one another, and to end what it means to be an addict and the stigma around addiction. And I remember um, a while back, Jackson's family held a beautiful celebration of life overlooking this gorgeous lake on a beautiful day. It was sunny out, the sun was reflecting off the water, his mom had an incredible taste, so everything was just beautiful. And Ian showed up high. Ian showed up, my brother showed up high. And I was looking at my brother, and Mr. Reynolds finished his speech. I was like, does anybody have anything to say? I was looking at my brother, and I knew, I saw it in his eyes that he wanted to say something, but he couldn't. He physically couldn't. And I decided to speak on my brother's behalf. And I got on stage, and I gave the serenity prayer. And I want to share it, actually. That's why we're going to get to that. I'm from, sorry. And from that moment on, I've been finding myself speaking at events like this. I've been part of not easy fits going into high school, giving us that place. And becoming like a part and a group member of incredible opportunities just like this one. This is incredible. Everybody who showed up here today, this is amazing. And I'm no stranger to addiction. Like I said, my brother Ian Healing, you know him. It's a story. And he was a 11 year IV heroin user. So, what happened was when COVID happened, as with many of you, it just changed the path of my life. It was like a big shake in my life. And Ian started reaching out to me then, and he started eating out again. And I had him over my place and hanging out. He was sick. He was 6'3, he's tall, and he weighed about 100 pounds. And his veins were collapsed. He was just dying. I physically saw him dying in front of me. And he was sitting in the bathroom wanting to use, and I came in, I turned the tub on, and I was like, wash your, wash your feet. Just wash your feet. Take your socks off, wash your feet. And he looked at me, like I had like five heads, and like he like slanted and started laughing uncontrollably. And I swear, that, like it was just like a light switch snapping. Like it was a flip of a switch in him. It was like death to life. And I saw it. And it wasn't, it was bright. And he chose, and like I knew that day after seeing that light that he still had it in him. I knew he wasn't done. And I knew he wanted to get better. And after seeing it, I also knew I could help him. I knew I could bring it back. So I did what any nerd would do is I read books. I read Harvard Business School reviews. I learned about the opioid crisis. I learned about addiction. I learned about big pharma. I learned about the statistics. I got down and dirty and I studied it and I meditated and I planned. And I came up with this theory that was going to change everything. So, and I came up with a hypothesis. I was like a little scientist for, for a few, for like a month. And um, fast forward back to Jackson's celebration of life. After the ceremony, my mom and I kind of maneuvered this a little bit. She left early so Ian couldn't leave with her. And Ian willingly got in my 2006 Honda Civic. And we packed it up into a four hour car ride to a log cabin in the middle of the woods in Vermont. That was a very hard car ride. He was, I was worried about him actually. I was very worried about him because he's high. Enough. But when we got to Vermont, I helped suck the poison out of my brother's blood. And helping my brother was hard. And it wasn't hard in the way we worked hard at school. And it wasn't hard in the way my career, the Department of Defense was hard. This was hard on a psychological level. Helping him was hard emotionally and spiritually. To break the stigma that he held on himself, the stigma that he carried in this person, the way he believed about himself, I had to tear down this distorted reality that he had, who he was. And I refused to look at my brother as another victim of trauma, as a guinea pig that they like to throw in sight boards. And being the adult I am now, looking back at a doctor who labels a little boy or a little girl as bipolar, 
so I know better now. And we're not going to tell you there's a special opioid out there that's not addictive. Right? What? what is that? What's that about? I was angry about it for a while, for a very long time. A lot of my childhood was very angry at a lot of people, a lot of adults. But I'm smarter now, and I don't hold on to anger. And I knew the statistics behind me and before we went to Vermont. You know what I mean? Like 11 year IV heroin user. I was aware. You know, I was aware of the risk reward. I was putting myself into emotionally opening myself up to my brother again. I knew what I was doing. So I thought really logically about it. And I decided that even if I couldn't save my brother's life, which I did, I did help save my brother's life, I could make an impact on the younger generation. So that another sister like me would not have to bury her brother like what she did Jackson. <laughs> and in that moment, for the younger me was born. And he's battling his opioid addiction with his sister's help was created. 21 days off heroin, a 21 day documentary that has been shown virally across the world. 21 days, that's all I needed, that's all we needed, that's all he needed, it was 21 days. It's a really good documentary. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, a lesson learned is a lesson shared, and every day of those 21 days was hard. That tested everything, everything I had in me every single day. And, but I saw it, I saw it day by day, it was the snowball effect. I saw him coming back, and he was low. My brother was a low, low one. And it was 21 days, and a lesson learned is a lesson shared. So I'm going to share with you the hardest part, and that was breaking the stigma. It was breaking the stigma he felt for himself. It was like something that was engraved in him. And breaking it, being like, no, like, that's not who you have to be. You're allowed to change yourself any day you want to. You're allowed to get up and literally be a different person if you want to. You're allowed to completely erase, get a new phone, take a new social media page. You're allowed to completely change everything about yourself. And it took me a while to like figure out the code in the end. Like the first week was really hard. The second week was really harder. <laughs> but once I figured out the code, like he had this loop and he had this code and it was in his brain. And once I discovered it, and once I kind of snapped in me, like I'm good at pattern recognition. So I was looking at my brother as like a pattern. And like he had patterns that I wanted to implement change in. So what I did was I started planting, I saw the things he was into and I started planting seeds in his mind. I started planting the right seeds and I started supporting the right memories. I started talking about the good ideas. I started empowering the positive thoughts that I ignored and dismissed the negative ones. And I also changed his diet. I'm going to turn this out, but I'll attribute a lot to his diet. There was no caffeine, no sugar. It was very because when you're having caffeine like that, the energy is too high. And he caught on quickly. He didn't like it, but he caught on. And the journey now is so much less about him, and it's more about empowering this younger generation. And how are we doing this for the younger Jackson? How are we doing this for my brother, or the younger me, or the younger you, because we all have a story? And what are we doing for them to target them, to reroute them, to empower them at a much younger age to have a net benefit on society? And now for the younger me, we're holding a summer camp, July 17th to July 22nd, where I will be teaching the younger generation about cleaning up their mental mess, how to reprogram their minds, teaching them about mass market manipulation, teaching them about social media manipulation, and how to just engage with them and empower them and improve their well-being. And I was sitting down the other day, and Ian came in, and 
And it was the papers in his hand. He put them on my desk. And he was like, smiling cheek to cheek, proud as a clown. And he was just like, Mary, from the end. And I just took my place in the tufts for Ray and Valley Community College. <laughs> And if I could go back and tell my younger self that, tell my younger self that my brother's here today, I would cry. I would cry. And as Jackson Reynolds would say, that it's not an easy fix, but there is always hope. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mary Rose. And thank you for sharing your personal experience. And I'm sure many of you relate on different levels and how we ourselves can plant empowering seeds of positivity. So to bring us home, where do we go from here? To bring us home, we'd like to highlight some of the other initiatives that our operations and planning division of the Human Services Department has been working on to move this ball uphill and provide culturally competent, accessible, and affordable services to those who live and work in Somerset County. Please help me welcome Nina Johnson, Human Services Coordinator. Acknowledge all the work the council members have. 
have been delayed because this is an important issue. So please stay tuned as we continue to fight for change. Another aspect of my role is serving as the advisor for the Somerset County Youth Council. The council is a lot, it's a lot of kids, but the council <laughs> comprises students from grades seven to twelve. Members participate in year-round events and community service activities. Through participation, students develop friendships, build leadership skills, and make meaningful connections with their local communities. I want to share that we have an event coming up next Thursday, May 25th, in collaboration with Tri-County CMO and the Office of Youth Services and our Office Operations and Planning entitled Youth Tell Us. This event will be the first step in our endeavor to, to strengthen connections between youth and their parents or adults in their lives regarding mental health. We want to start the conversation, conversation with youth, allowing their voices to be heard. The U.S. Surgeon General said it best, far too many young people are struggling with their mental health and unable to get the support they need. We all have a role to play in supporting youth mental health and creating a world where young people thrive. Probably like most of you in this room today, I have a passion for doing what I can to uplift and help others in need. During my time here in the county, I have coordinated various events to provide information, support, and much needed resources to our vulnerable populations. One event in particular is our free community resource event. This event was first initiated in response to the effects of Hurricane Ida. After Ida, I was tasked with calling residents to identify their immediate needs. As you know, many people lost everything, and some of the people I spoke with were reported still wearing the same clothes from the night of the storm almost a week out. It was truly heartbreaking. I came up with the idea to find a way to get free clothing and resources to the community. While looking for a location, I was connected with Good Shepherd, who had recently hosted an event, and the rest is history. This weekend will be the fourth time we will be hosting this event in collaboration with Good Shepherd Lutheran Church and the Giving Network. And each time we host this event, it grows larger, which makes me so happy. Um, and this past October, we served about 100 households each day. Um, the event will be held today from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., so right after this happens. <laughs> um, and tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 2. And it is open to all residents to leave. We do not ask for any identification or anything like that. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not give a special thank you to the Food Bank Network as well for their generous con contributions for snacks to the pain. So I leave you with this quote by Mother Teresa I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the borders to create many ripples. I challenge each of you to share these events and information you learned today with a loved one or someone who may be in need. And I invite you to collaborate and participate in future events so we can support, educate, and continue to make Somerset County significant. So again, my name is Rita Johnson. My contact information will be available after this presentation. And I thank you for your time and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Um, it really fills me with a sense of optimism that seems kind of fleeting these days. You know? So when I get it, I'm going to hold on to it. My book is full on. It's from all of you, so thank you. Um, I'm Zach Billiger. I'm the planning administrator for the county, and uh, I'm not going to tell you what that means. <laughs> I'm going to talk about, as was mentioned earlier, and probably saw it out front, something I'm very excited about, which is our Somerset Health Total Mobile Outreach Ban, which is actually us. Um, this initiative has been years in the making, and uh, I'm very excited to be able to have this resource to address some of the largest barriers to receiving help that our residents face. Uh, and they are public transportation, availability of transportation. Um, and this one was surprising to me when I first saw it. And actually, in the last statewide needs assessment, it was identified around New Jersey as the greatest barrier to people receiving services and resources and help. It's just not knowing what exists in their communities. Uh, 
it's been referenced here today, and you can see it here today. We have great people in the helping professions in Somerset County. We have great agencies, and we have a lot of services and resources. We're very lucky compared to most people in this country. Uh, but if you don't know what exists, then you can't ask for help. Uh, so I'm really excited to drive this thing out with all of our great partners in this county. Park it on the street for a year and have some conversations, and hopefully, you know, get some people some help when they need it. Uh, so, thank you very much. I'm going to run outside and be standing by. If you would like to talk more about this, I am always happy to talk. You know? And um, particularly uh, to our agency partners, if I haven't spoken to you yet about this or you haven't heard me. You're going to get an email, and I will be able to reach out to me. Uh, we launch there. This is a uh, this is an asset we can leverage to get the attention of the people that we are mandating. Yeah. So, and if you are in a community about Somerset County, you're having an event, or there's something that you notice, uh, you don't have enough food in this area. It's really hard for people to get connected to A, B, C. Give me a call, write me an email. Let's get some people together. Let's leverage many hands made by them. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Federico. I'm the initial services director for the Somerset County Department of Human Services. And I wear a few different hats, but today I'm mostly going to talk about the opiate settlement funds. Does anybody know what that is? Okay. So the opiate settlement funds is a national litigation coming from the devastating effects of overprescribing and harmful marketing of prescription pain medication and the opiate epidemic that we see thereafter. Somerset County will receive approximately $450,000 per year for the next 18 years. As of right now, that number is increased. We pay more for when to start. Um, and the funds have to be used for the list of approved purposes. And that is from a memorandum of agreement between New Jersey and the national litigation. So states, counties, and towns can't just use the money for, uh, you know, salaries and, and, and things like that. It needs to be for substance use disorder, prevention, recovery support, or treatment specifically. Um, a list of a few of the examples are up there. Uh, they're very broad. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a few things that we've already done and a few things that we are doing. All uh, right, how do we ensure that you uh, trust us to use these funds appropriately? We created a advisory council to help steer the funds. They provide input and advice and recommendations to the county on how to use these funds. Um, if you are on the council and you're here still, please stand up for a quick second for the Opiate Settlement Advisory Council. Next up, there, cool. <laughs> Ken was here somewhere. Um, uh, it's a group of. Uh, There's a, there's a group of uh, <laughs> treatment providers, uh, recovery support specialists, persons in, in long-term recovery. Uh, we have a member of the prosecutor's office there. We have a member of the health department there. Uh, so, so we're really process this collaborative effort on, on the use of these funds. Um, so the first thing that we allocated settlement funds towards is sober living. Um, we know that when a resident is coming out of inpatient treatment or, or maybe doesn't have stable housing and, and that's a part of their recovery, uh, they may need to get linked up with, with recovery housing. Uh, but if they've been in treatment for a long time, maybe they can't quite afford the moving fees or the, the weekly rent, or maybe they need help finding recovery housing because that's also a struggle. Um, so we awarded uh, $7,000 to New Hope Integrated Behavioral Health to do just that. A resident now has the option to sit with a case manager, find a recovery house, 
uh, that, that suits them, uh, but also the settlement funds will help that resident pay for the recovery housing. So moving costs, weekly rent, things like that. Um, and that was, again, awarded to be hoping you could pay for all. The second use of the funds that we, we've already done is allocate some money to community crisis, all of them are not orange, uh, to help them with their peer recovery services. Uh, and, and specifically their peer recovery pop-up services. So that whole theme of taking services to the resident, taking services to the community, um, and, and meeting people where they're at. So some of those services might include one-on-one -on -one CPRS support, recovery coaching, um, free Narcan kits, fentanyl test strips, and free wellness items. Uh, if you have any questions about the peer recovery pop-ups, I will probably forward you to the experts that are doing these services over there at CIC, um, but they will be most likely in your community this year. Sorry, there's a lot of feedback. <laughs> um, so the, the third thing that we've already done in the settlement funds is create the behavioral health system navigator program. Um, as we know, there are a lot of resources in Somerset County, and sometimes that's hard to navigate. Um, maybe you don't need a hundred different resources in a pamphlet to help you connect to services. Um, sometimes you just need the number that works for you. Um, so I will perfectly segue into introducing Stephanie Billets, our behavioral health system navigator. There's absolutely no pressure about being one of the last people to speak after a long day of hearing people speak. So I will keep it short and sweet, but one of the good things about being one of the last folks to speak is that I'm hoping that the information that I give you will stick with you all. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, I am Stephanie Billets. I am the behavioral health system navigator. So essentially my role here is to connect our residents to either substance use and or mental health treatment services. So our eviction services director and our mental health administrator recognized that there was an influx of calls coming in from our residents needing to be connected to these services. And while we recognize that Somerset County is a very resource rich area, that's a lot of information to kind of have to go through. And for someone who's trying to navigate those services, it can be very overwhelming. Um, so it, it is a mixture of things. So I like to pretty much vet a lot of the resources before I give them up to someone because there's nothing like blindly giving someone a resource and then they might not end up taking their insurance. They no longer in practice. Maybe they change the scope of their practice. And we found a lot of that was happening after um, COVID-19 and hurricane items. We know Somerset County was vastly affected by um, the hurricane. So uh, just as a, a kind of live example, while I was here at the conference today helping everything run, uh, last night before I left the office, I had a pair reach out. They were looking to get uh, their youth connected to a, a service. So I went through my list of contacts and I was like, okay, based upon the insurance and the needs of this individual, who, who comes to mind? And so right away I was able to reach out to one of our contacts who's actually sitting in the room right now. They responded very quickly and said, you know what? I actually just had a cancellation. Are they able to send me over their information? So I went on that right away. We were able to get them an appointment right away because as we know, a lot of our providers right now, it's taking a little bit of time to get an appointment. The mental health system, especially substance use as well, our services are inundated right now because fortunately, a lot of folks are recognizing that they need to get connected to resources, but unfortunately, due to staffing issues that we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there, there's a shortage, there's wait lists for services. And that's another big portion of my position is just to be the know of who has wait lists. I like to manage folks' expectations when they reach out to me. You know, are you in immediate need of service? Or is it okay if you wait two or three weeks to get connected to, say, a therapist or a psychiatrist? Um, so I am here as a resource for Somerset County residents, meaning that they live or work in Somerset County. And I'm here to provide them with information, free support, and work. So best way to think of this position is a resource navigator. Uh, 
Um, so I'm a point of contact for individuals, again, living or working in that group home accessing substance use or mental health treatment services. I'm not going to go into this lengthy list of services. This also is not an exhaustive list. Um, but on the substance use side of things, a lot of the referrals that come in are folks that are online to get someone connected to the talks. Um, maybe an IOP program, um, or recovery support services. And as Lisa mentioned, we are working on um, funding social learning options for individuals. And then on the mental health side of things, kind of the top two polls that I see we're getting are therapy and psychiatry. As we know, there's a little bit of a shortage for psychiatrists. Um, again, that's part of my position to manage folks' expectations and really get an idea of what services that they're looking to get connected to. Um, oftentimes, folks will reach out and maybe look on for resources for someone else for a loved one. Or they need that help. Or they're on a conversation and I've been talking with them. I'm like, hey, have, have you yourself connected to resources? Have you thought about going to support group or maybe seeking therapy? Um, so sometimes folks call for someone else in the name of you know, resources for themselves. Um, but this position really exists because I not only have an awesome supervisor, I have an awesome team that I can always lean my head on. We have an amazing director, and then not only to mention that with the leadership above us and our councils that really support this and recognize that this was a need in our community. We have folks asking if this exists in other counties because again, it's, it's becoming more well known in this field that this is absolutely a service that's needed. We want to therapy and want more handoff to connect folks to services rather than people going on a Google search or going through a database and ending up at a dead end. We want to make sure that there really is a linkage to services and to implement services at that. Um, so my contact information will be made available. You can call me, you can email me, you can text me, whatever is more comfortable for you. Um, we just want to make everyone aware that this is a voluntary service. So this is meant for the folks who are ready to navigate the behavioral health system. Um, so if you have any questions, you feel free to grab me after the conference. Again, I know I'm the last speaker of the day, so everyone's really trying to absorb all this great information that they were given today. Um, but without further ado, I'll actually announce it back to our team. There's our lovely MC. Rita, Zach, our entire OAP staff, who we'll work on the OAP chant, Amy missed it. So I'm going to bring it now to May and Mark to give our closing remarks and as we end the event today. But again, this will continue to go forth in our everyday lives as we practice. <laughs> I just want to say that I started the trend of crying. I just, <laughs> I just want to say thank you all so much for believing in I'm going to cry. Believing in this. And obviously, something touched everybody here. Um, there, there was something, no matter what story it was, maybe you couldn't relate to it, but there was an element that, that did. But again, none of this could have been done without our chair, Mark Williams. <laughs> Pass it over to you. Okay. No, I'm good. Very, very quickly. Um, everyone, I should say everyone, folks know how much we are hurting for clinicians out there in the community sense of that. I want to put a plug in for volunteers. There are a lot of organizations um, that provide services that are almost totally dependent on volunteers. A shameless plug for NAMI New Jersey and, and NAMI Somerset who are in the house, who have peer-led and persons um, with a lived experience, family members and loved ones who get, who get trained to do the programs. Um, so visit their table on the way out, sign up to become a member of NAMI New Jersey at the entry level, five bucks, folks, that's all it 
cost of, um, at the entry level. And the reason why I'm talking about this is that people say, well, I can't volunteer, I don't have enough time. Volunteer to sit behind a table for one afternoon, once a year, and you're done. You're done. And you get 12 other people to do that, and then you have every month covering for the whole year. You get your team together. The second thing I wanted to talk about is these fabulous t shirts. <laughs> these t shirts were made by an organization out in Blackhorn, Pennsylvania, who also uh, published the book that we were giving out. Hold on for a second. Published the book. They're an organization that uh, provides services for the development of the disabled. And they have um, a place here called Woodswear. And it's a print shop. They make t shirts, they put things on mugs, they make hoodies, and things like that. Um, they're very inexpensive. It's not for profit. If you want one of the t shirts to wear to your event to show off Somerset County, I have business cards of mine with my email address on it. Tell me what size you want, how many you want. I'll take it out the woods where it benefits those individuals who are higher enough functioning who can work and have uh, and still have meaningful uh, work in their lives um, while providing a worthwhile product for the community. Thank you very much. That's it. That's all we have. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. All the comfort room, all of our vendors and speakers. Please take whatever you need. Oh, and the survey on the table, please. If you were, if you haven't already done that, please use the QR code, scan it to your phone, and please let us know what we can do. Thank you all. See you next year.